Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Leonidas Heliotis. I'm the current director of the Mannheim Center for Criminology at the LSE. I'm also an associate professor in the Department of Social Policy at LSE. Um, it is my distinct uh, honor and privilege to be chairing this conversation today with professors Paul Rock and Tim Newbern, two internationally leading scholars on issues of crime and criminal justice. Uh, the original plan of this event um, was for Professor David Downs to be with us as well, uh, which has not been possible due to unforeseen uh, circumstances. Nevertheless, uh, we will be arranging a separate event with David as soon as this is uh, possible. Uh, Professors Rock and Newben will of course be very well known uh, to our audience. I will therefore say only a few words of introduction about each of them before we turn uh, to our discussion. Uh, professor Paul Rock is Emeritus Professor of Sociology and former Director of the Mannheim Center uh, for Criminology at the LSE. He has held visiting uh, positions in a number of universities and institutions around the world, including uh, the University of Pennsylvania, Princeton University, and the Center for the Advanced Study of the Behavioral, St uh, of the Behavioral Sciences in Stanford, California. Uh, his interests uh, focus on the development of criminal justice policies, particularly for victims of crime, but he has also published numerous articles on criminological theory and the history of crime. Um, he is the author of a number of classic uh, books, including, amongst others, Reconstructing a Women's Prison, After Homicide, Practical and Political Responses to Bereavement, and Constructing Victims' Rights. Professor Tim Newben has been Professor of Criminology and Social Policy at the LSE since 2002, and he has also been Director of the Mannheim Center between 2003 and 2009. His research has spanned a number of areas, including policing, restorative justice, youth justice, drugs and alcohol, comparative policy making, and urban violence. He was the LSE's lead on Reading the Riots, the prize-winning research with The Guardian on the 2011 disorder. And he too is the author of a great number of books, including, amongst others again, The Future of Policing, Private Security and Public Policing, Policy Transfer and Criminal Justice. And his forthcoming books include uh, Orderly, Orderly Britain, How We Solve Our Everyday Problems from, from Dog Mess to Double Parking. Today's conversation, however, uh, will be focused specifically on the work that Paul and Tim along with uh, David Downs, have been doing in the context of the official history of criminal justice in England and Wales. Paul has recently published two volumes stemming from this project. The first one is entitled The Liberal Hour, Capital Punishment, Abortion and Homosexual Law Reform. And the second one is entitled Institution Building, which focuses uh, specifically on the Crown Court and the Prosecution Service. Another volume to have emerged from the broader project is David Downs' The Rise and Fall of Penal Hope. And as I said earlier, a separate event will be organized with David to talk specifically about that book. Tim and David have completed another volume entitled The Politics of Law and Order. And Tim himself is also currently completing a further book on policing. Without further ado, let me warmly welcome Paul and Tim to this event today. Uh, it's an online uh, event, of course. Uh, we all wish we uh, were uh, together in the same room, um, but it's still possible for us to do this event. And this is uh, a great opportunity for our audience to learn more about the official history of criminal justice, which, as I said earlier, will be the main focus of the event. So um, if I may uh, start with uh, a broad uh, question, um, can I please invite uh, you both, uh, beginning with Paul, um, uh, to tell us a bit about uh, the history of the official history of criminal justice, as it were, how it came about and how you came, how you became involved in it. Thank you very much. Um, to be candid, I don't think any of us were particularly curious about the, you know, the, the the earlier origins of 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 the official history of criminal justice. It it was a proposal that went through uh, a, an elaborate process of discussion within cabinet. Um, the political parties were 
involved largely to get their permission for us to look at their uh, uh, at, at their uh, records because um, many of the records were really quite recent. Um, when it came to us, it was a very English process of taking soundings rather than open competition. Um, and two of us were uh, approached uh, about whether we wanted to put in a submission. Um, and we decided that in fact, we it was a very broad field. Um, we didn't have competence uh, in all the subjects. So we um, made a suggestion to a third person um, that we would put in a joint submission um, broadly covering uh, the, some of the areas that were uh, booted by the cabinet office, but adding an elaborate kind of superstructure of theoretical concerns, most of which simply disappeared over time because they were impracticable. Um, we had a division of labor. We, we, we thought initially that we were going to write as it were all the volumes together, but that was simply not feasible. Um, I was reminded of uh, a critique of uh, the new criminology, which was also written by uh, three authors, and uh, the, the the critic in the British Journal of Criminology said, "How is it possible to, for three people to speak with one voice?" And we discovered that we couldn't, so we split split the task up uh, between ourselves. I had never written about uh, any of the areas that um, I came to I came to uh, I, I, I came to to write about, um, but they were intriguing and. Uh, um, yeah. Shall I add a little to that? I mean, it's and, and thank you, Leo, from me too, for for the kind introduction and and for hosting this. Just just to elaborate on a couple of things that that, that Paul said. I mean, it was a strange kind of process, the the birth of the official history of criminal justice, as it were. And, you know, these things, I think it's worth saying, uh, you know, there's a long, there is a long history to them. There are official histories of a whole host of um, peacetime public policy um, issues. Um, as it's proven, this is, at least as, as, at the time we're speaking, this is the last that the Cabinet Office have commissioned. So uh, currently there is no longer an official history programme, which is terribly sad. We, we, of course, didn't know that at the time that we, we were to be the last. Um, the intention, I think, behind the official histories is to try, as it were, to com commission historians to, um, to construct some sort of public record, that is to use what's available officially, which is one of the reasons that the word official, uh, I think, um, attaches to the title. To use to use the public record to use official documents to um, provide those who have haven't the time and the rest as it were to spend their lives in the archives to get a kind of sense of the particular territory that is the focus of of the history at hand in in our case criminal justice. I think the second thing I'd say about about this project is that the 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 initial brief that was given to people who might have an interest um, in doing this was was very legalistic. Its focus was very much on criminal justice and criminal justice institutions. So in that old rather odd divide that Americans sometimes um, are kind of recognize, it was much less criminological and much more criminal justice in its focus. And one of the things I think we did well, there were a number of things we did in responding um, to that call. One was to shift the focus much more towards areas of territory that you might think as the sort of staples of criminology or some of the staples of criminology and less on um, the courts and legal procedure and so forth, which were the, the originally kind of dominating bits so far as the cabinet office was concerned. And secondly, it was to broaden the whole thing. Um, so not only was the initial brief quite kind of narrowly legalistic, it was just quite narrow. Um, so the other, the other thing that Paul was saying was, well, you know, it was quite, quite difficult to imagine covering all the territory. Even with three of us, I think we still felt it was pretty much impossible, both in terms of the time it would take, but also in terms of any expertise we might claim to cover all the things that we could do. So, so the five volumes that you that you outlined in your introduction were kind of 
as it were, there are attempts to cover some of the territory. You know, I think any critic would very quickly say, but what about X or Y? And if I could add to that, as soon as we got into the process of research, we realized that at least in some areas, the um, uh, documentation was so rich and the possibilities were so broad that the only feasible way of going ahead was through a series of detailed case studies rather than very broad brush kind of aerial views. So what we have done, I think, is given, as it were, um, rather intense um, focused focused studies that we've, we've, we, we're aware that there of, there's a great deal of territory we've neglected, but that I think is inevitable. Some of it, of course, we uh, we or other people have dealt with elsewhere anyway. Um, and in the second volume, um, I was surprised to learn that nobody had written the history of the origins of the Crown Court. Nobody had written the hi history of the origins of the of the uh, uh, Crown Prosecution Service. So uh, it, it it warranted, I think, a, a detailed examination. Thank you. This is really fascinating and uh, very exciting to know. You have both touched on issues of method, and you have mentioned, of course, the archives inevitably. Um, could you could you elaborate uh, a bit on 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 issues of methods, um, for example, with regard to how you selected amongst uh, the archives that uh, the archival sources that were available to you, which ones to emphasize, which ones to uh, leave out, perhaps, or to focus uh, to a lesser degree on. Um, and, and also, can you describe for us a little bit more about the, the actual process of accessing uh, those archives, going uh, to the actual site and engaging with the authorities there? Paul, can I, can I invite you to answer first? I was omnivorous. Um, the, the thing I discovered, for example, in the National Archives is only 2% of government records actually are uh, retained. A great deal is thrown away. So it's not as if uh, we were um, spoiled, spoiled for cho choice. However, in particular areas, there was a great deal of documentation, not only in the National Archives in Kew, but also elsewhere, for example, in, in the Churchill Archives in, in Cambridge, uh, in the Bodleian, in the British Library. And I, for one, simply didn't want to exclude anything because it seemed to me that, um, uh, it, you know, it, it would be presumptuous and premature simply to rule out any archive material that might be available. And we discovered more and more as, t as, as, as time went by. And unusually, we were given an, a very generous amount of time uh, in which to... Uh, in, in which to uh, uh, carry out the work. I mean, you know, it's still in its, it, it, it's in its, uh, you know, first, it's still in its first decade, as it were. So um, we were not pressed. The, the research funding was very generous. We were given um, uh, travel money. We were given photocopying money. We were given um, transcription. It wasn't, the second thing is, it wasn't only archival research we relied upon. We also went to, uh, all the secondary sources we could find, newspapers, um, academic articles and the rest. And we relied very heavily on interviews. And uh, in some cases it was timely because uh, I discovered that a number of the people who were especially helpful um, uh, have died since. So we, we, we were there as it were, just in the nick of time. And that is one of the strengths, I think, of, of what we managed to achieve. We, we have on record things that otherwise would have simply disappeared. I, I started out like Paul thinking that, that being an omnivore was the way to be. And, and perhaps, my, perhaps my capacity for, for consumption is less than Paul's. But it, it's, it was, I, I, I started off um, on the sort of history of policing. We, 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 um, we were given an office, slightly odd office, in then in, in by the cabinet office who we were working for effectively in Admiralty Arch, um, which they at that stage still owned. And files were delivered to Admiralty Admiralty Arch. I, I put in some initial orders, which just almost turned out to fill the office. You know, just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of mainly home office files, which which I saw the titles of and I thought, well, this will be fascinating. And I, 
it was really a mistake. I became just simply overwhelmed by the amount of material. So the question you were asking, Leo, about, you know, how, how do you make those decisions were ones that, that, in a sense, one of the things I learned rather late in the process was that I was quite late in making a decision about how to sift and what the process should be. And I think the more traditional way of going about these things is to is to sort of start at the top of the tree, you know, is to begin with the prime minister's files and the cabinet minutes and things like that, and then work one's way down into departmental files following particular lines of inquiry. Whereas certainly for the policing bit of the history, I mean, I learned the error of my ways, but I started within the ministry itself, with that case, the Home Office, and sort of worked my way out. Um, and that partly explains why the book still isn't out, as Paul <laughs> reminds us, almost a decade after it was commissioned. Um, partly because I, I, you know, I did get I get lost in, even though, as he says, most most is shredded. There's still the the vast quantity of detail that existed. Um, but but then sort of subsequently, I think, you know, I did follow that process of thinking, actually, one needs to begin elsewhere and started so far as policing was concerned. And we'll come back to talk about it in more detail uh, in a few minutes, no doubt. But but both with sort of cabinet and prime minister's files, but also with policing files. So um, the, asso the Association of Chief Police Officers, as was, um, has an archive now up in Hull, but which, which was at the Open University, which spent a bit of time in going through that. And that was quite helpful, albeit it was chaotic. Um, and then on the politics side of things, um, as with Paul, interviewing was really helpful. So David Downs and I interviewed quite a few home, ex-home secretaries, which um, was a very good way of um, both sort of starting and locating um, many of the themes that I think we then followed up through other means. And on top of that, I was very surprised at the the candor, almost the confessional nature of some of the interviews I, I conducted. I mean, people admitted to mistakes and regrets and um, turning points, which in, in a way that was extremely enlightening. The second thing, of course, was the usual um, process of uh, snowballing. In other words, you, p people we interviewed suggested others and, and they suggested others in a great chain. And after a while, one built, had built up a, very, a rather impressive assembly of perspectives of those who had been involved in critical processes that we were trying to document. Thank you, that, that's, that, that's really fascinating to hear and very inspiring also. So can I, I, I suggest that we now focus a bit more on the specific volumes that have come out or are about to come out. And, um, he, um, starting with, with Paul's volume one, uh, Paul, as I said earlier, has already published uh, two volumes. Um, so if we can start, Paul, with your first uh, book from this project, The Liberal Hour, um, what are the main findings uh, of, of the book? And also, uh, if you could please also reflect on the methodological issues we just discussed, perhaps with specific reference uh, to the work you undertook for that book, that would be really interesting to hear. I looked at um, uh, the three areas that you listed, capital, the abolition of capital punishment that was affected in 65 and two acts that uh, uh, were passed in 67, um, uh, the uh, one um, uh, permitting abortion uh, as a legal uh, procedure under certain circumstances and the um, abolition, uh, the, the de decriminalization of uh, uh, homosexual acts between consenting men over the age of uh, over, over the age of 21. It's ground that's been covered quite well before, and there was a handicap in that many of the principles um, are now dead. Um, I mean, this is a long time ago. It's it's almost 60 years ago. So that uh, it 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 was um, it was problematic. I mean, curiously enough, uh, I when one was thinking about Frank Soskis, who was the Home Secretary. Um, at, at critical t times. Um, uh, his son, David, is a colleague of ours. Uh, his daughter-in-law, Nikki Lacey, uh, is a colleague of ours. I spoke to both of them. And I also spoke to um, the son of Sidney Silverman, who was the backbencher, who was pushing through um, uh, legislation um, obsessively year after year after year and eventually was successful. 
but it, it was not, it, most of the uh, evidence I had was, was secondhand. If there was anything that struck me as being interesting about it, it was twofold. One is that the conventional narrative about the origin of the uh, decriminalization of homosexual um, acts was is that the trial of a, a number of rather illustrious people, Wild Blood uh, and, and, and Mont Lord Montague in particular, uh, was regarded as such a, a scandalous and oppressive procedure that um, uh, it should not be allowed to happen again. And this was the kind of, uh, I think, the received story. If you go into the cabinet papers, however, you discover that it, the inquiry that led to the legislation um, under Wolfson uh, was actually prompted, prompted by the Home Secretary at the time, David Maxwell Fife, uh, being shocked at the noxious publicity that was being atta uh, attached to um, uh, uh, homosexual acts in trials. And he wanted to see whether there was some way of curtailing it without interfering with, uh, as it were, the freedom of the press and the transparency of justice. He then moved on, but that was his initial brief. He just thought that this was appalling, that this kind of material you know, was being leaked out into the public um, and might corrupt, uh, corrupt people. Um, that is not, as it were, the conventional, conventional story. The second thing that uh, struck me throughout was, uh, and it was a revelation to me, was the role played by the Church of England, uh, who I think has been very neglected uh, in, in, in the past. They were a kind of church militant at the time. Um, they remodeled um, utilitarian theory, the theory of John Stuart Mill about two concepts of liberty. And they said, in effect, there are uh, sins, which are the business of the church, and there are crimes, which are the business of the state. And um, behavior that does not deleteriously affect anybody else uh, should uh, not be a subject of, uh, of, of state intervention. Um, so that, for example, uh, Wolfenden, who was a, a, a devout Anglican, was persuaded that um, it was that the homosexual acts were were were, were uh, perverse and and pernicious, even although he was slightly hypocritical because his son Jeremy was 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 gay, um, and he knew him to be gay, and he told him to keep his distance whilst the inquiry was going on. Um, nevertheless, he said he talked to a priest, and the priest had said, "How many of the Ten Commandments are criminalized?" And he they came back with an agreement that might maybe, might be about three and a half, and the argument was then. Well, why should homosexual acts be criminalized? What harm do they do? And there was, of course, the heart devil in debate about all this and about whether it's possible to have private wrongs which don't, as it were, undermine um, society. But that was an argument that, that persuaded him. And it took a very long time. It took 10 years between the publication of the report and legislation uh, for people to be persuaded. It shocked, the, it shocked a great many people. There was a great deal of opposition, but it won through. And it was the church who, which was, I think, quite valiant in, in saying, you know, we may detest this conduct, we may dislike it, but nonetheless, you know, we, the, the, the consequences of it are so adverse um, that we have no right to interfere in the private lives of, of individuals. Um, that was the, that was really quite a quite a, a, an astonishing revelation, and I don't think it's been covered adequately uh, in, in 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 much of the literature. It applied to abortion law reform too. There's a utilitarian argument that said, um, you know, it's wrong to kill, which is the Catholic position, but under certain circumstances, you have to make a choice between the life of the child and the life of the mother, and uh, the life of the mother is probably more valuable. So it was, as it were, you know, the greatest happiness of the greatest number um, being applied there. Um, and it, it, you, go to, you go to Hansard, you go to uh, the records as I did in the Lambeth Library of uh, the, the Archbishop of Canterbury. And it's very clear, it's an extremely rich documentation of all the work that was done around these issues. And it's quite clear that the church was interfering step by step and very vigorously and tried to liberalize uh, criminal legislation. Thank you, Paul. This is really so interesting. And, and of course, the role of, uh, of the church, of religious forces more generally, is something that uh, 
definitely needs to be looked at uh, in greater depth uh, in the broader field of criminal justice research. And I'm sure your book will be very inspiring in this regard. Can we, can we now uh, discuss about the, uh, can you now tell us a bit more about the second book, uh, well, Institution Building, which uh, focuses on the Crown Court and the prosecution service? I think um, that there was a very real advantage in that the legislation I was touching upon was much later. Uh, not that well, 1971 was the Courts Act, 1985 was the Prosecution of Offences Act, and it was still possible to talk uh, to a greater number of people who had been involved centrally in the process. And I was particularly fortunate in being aided by Sir Derek Alton, who sadly has died, who was uh, the Secretary of the, of the Royal Commission on Assizes and Quarter Sessions, and then Permanent Secretary in the uh, Lord Chancellor's Department. And he, he, he briefed me step by step and very candidly about a great many of the uh, events that I was interested in. He gave me his own private memoirs, which uh, were kind of, you know, quite an insight into what w went on. And there were m many other people, people who sat on both royal commissions who, um, who, who talked to me. And it seemed to me that I have a much more generous coverage, a much more informed coverage of what happened in, uh, in two episodes uh, in the construction of uh, institutions, which have never, ever been covered before. However, I'm not sure that there was anything that was particularly uh, prone to what the Americans call a gee whiz moment. You know, there was nothing there that there's a, an article I always remember called, that's interesting, um, the phenomenology of, uh, uh, phenomenology of surprise and vice versa, something like that. There was never, you know, a, a gee whiz moment, but at least I plotted out in, in, in perhaps excessive detail all the stages of rather complex uh, processes of abolishing old institutions, in one case, the assizes, and in the other case, the police prosecuting solicitors system um, and their replacement. And it was a massive act of uh, social engineering. And I talked to everybody who was involved and I feel quite pleased with that. And I'm, I'm very grateful to the generosity of my informants, you know, who were, who were extremely, uh, extremely helpful. And, and, and as I said earlier on, it, it was part of a process of snowboarding. They said, why don't you talk to X or Y or Z in a, in a great chain? And I, I think I built up a complete picture, but I don't think there are any surprises there. I don't know if Tim disagrees because Tim, Tim's read them, but... Uh... May, may I ask a further question about this, however? Um, there is so much talk these days about how to dismantle certain criminal justice institutions or parts of criminal justice uh, institutions. Uh, the, the discussion usually revolves around how to do away with uh, the most pernicious aspects of what has come to be called mass incarceration. Um, so what are the lessons that we can learn from the analysis you did in this particular book for how people can go about uh, tackling mass incarceration? I don't know about mass incarceration because that really is not my field. I mean, what was clear to me uh, was the absolutely dominant role of the Lord Chancellor, Gerald Gardner, who played such a critical role in uh, criminal justice reform in mid-century. Uh, he was a man who was regarded as being an absolutely uh, superb lawyer. He was a man of great principle. And he was responsible, I think, for the founding of justice, for the Society of Labour Lawyers, for uh, reform of the legal aid system. He set up the Law Commission. Um, he was a driving force. I rather kind of... Uh, extravagantly link, uh, likened him to somebody like uh, Lord Brougham back, back in the 1830s and 1840s. And it, it was that kind of conviction, uh, which I think was important. I'm not sure that we have, ever, we have had subsequently any politician uh, with that degree of moral, legal and political authority who was co absolutely committed to, 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 to reform um, we, we've had, I think, uh, what uh, Derek Alton, the man I talked to, uh, by comparison, a lot of inerts. And the inerts, I think, um, have been unimpressive. Um, 
I mean, that, that is the, that, I think that, that is the first point. The second point is that the uh, scandals involved with the assizes, which were medieval institutions doing the wrong, uh, doing, going to the wrong places for the wrong place, uh, wrong, wrong, wrong uh, lengths of time, uh, simply were, were, the size system was breaking down and there was a crisis and the Lord Chief Justice at the time simply said, you know, we must do something very rapidly now. And uh, Lord Gardner responded. In the case of the CPS, uh, there was a scandal, uh, events, as it were, uh, which drove things forward in the, in the botched uh, uh, trial of three young men for uh, the murder of a, uh, of, of a prostitute, a male prostitute in, 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 in the 1970s. And that was so, as it were, uh, uh, pro, uh, revelatory, illuminating of deficiencies in 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 the, in the system that something had to be done, and here again you had a, a member of uh, Parliament, Christopher Price, driving things through obsessively, not letting them go. Um, I don't know where their counterparts are today, um, to be honest. Um, that I think is that I think is the important thing, but I would attribute an awful lot of significance to to, to Lord Gardner and one of our former colleagues, Linda Mulcahy, and I were at one time thinking of trying to write at least a short biography of uh, Gerald Gardner because we feel he's been um, uh, undervalued and, and and rather forgotten, and you know he deserves celebrity. I think in, in terms of the annals of uh, reform. Thank you. That's that's fascinating. And knowing your productivity, I can imagine that actually yeah. happening. Not on your nelly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so can, may I suggest that we move on to volume four? As I said earlier, there is volume three, which is David's book on which focuses on penal policy, but there will be a separate event on that. Uh, volume four, which is a book co-authored by Tim and David uh, on the politics uh, of law uh, and order. Uh, has been finished. It will be uh, appearing in due course in print. Um, so, Tim, can I invite you to discuss uh, the main findings of the book and perhaps, like Paul, reflect a little bit on the methodological challenges that you faced while... Yeah, th thanks, Leo. I mean, the politics one, as you'll appreciate, is sort of... It's an interesting one. This, this is, in one sense, such well-traveled territory that... Um, you know the idea that uh, the, that a book like this is is as it were going to have an in inverted commas findings which is somehow new. Uh, I think is is um, you know is a little slightly hard to imagine. I mean the period we're covering, I think it's worth saying here, is is the post-war period up to 1997. So when this whole official history was commissioned, the Labour Home Secretary at the time. Um, put an end date on it of 1997, which for, for anyone watching who doesn't know was the point at which the Blair government first came into power. Um, so they, they seemingly weren't that keen to have um, New Labour's record investigated too much. Um, so this, this book on the politics of law and order covers the period from 45 to 97, which is a period particularly the sort of as it were, the sort of, if we can call it this for shorthand, the Thatcher years of the 80s, and then the kind of rise of new labor in the 90s is very well-traveled territory, as I, as I say. Um, look, I, I, I think a number of things are quite interesting um, about the whole period. One, um, in, in no particular order here, but to pick up on something that Paul was certainly alluding to on several occasions is just how important scandal is. In driving, in driving reform to the extent that there is reform, but affecting the politics of the day. You know, the, all of those who have written about the office of Home Secretary have said, you know, this is, I mean, they were writing before the politics that we find ourselves in today, where, you know, scandal doesn't seem to attach quite so much to, to the incumbents of office in the way that it once did. But certainly, you know, in the second half of the 20th century, it, it was, as, as, as one Home Secretary said it, you know, the, the, the corridors of the Home Office are paved with dynamite. And it was that sense that, you know, you woke up in the morning and had no idea what was going to happen to you. That, out, you know, a, a from left field, a, a prison break, 
um, the, the, the shooting of a police officer, some scandal could emerge out of nowhere and, and completely disrupt things for the Home Secretary. And I think, um, you know, so the, one of the things that's clear through the whole period of the politics of criminal justice is just how important scandal is, at least to the, the kind of the landscape of law and order, if not necessarily to policy change um, the, whole, the whole time. A second thing I'd, I'd say, um, and it's not a new thing, but I think it's not said enough in all this, is that um, the people who are most obsessed with law and order are criminologists, not politicians. Um, you know, we, we, we as it were, we're, we're lucky enough, as it were, to earn our salaries studying it. Home secretaries, and now, you know, justice ministers latterly as well, are, are, you know, fortunate or unfortunate enough, depending on their perspective, to hold office um, in, in areas where uh, they have responsibility for some of these matters, policing and prisons and all, and all the rest of it. But actually, when it comes to the day-to-day -day politics of law and order, it ranks really low down the list. So that even, even those Thatcher administrations from 79 through to 1991 um, actually paid very little attention day to day to law and order. Sure, these, these things were big things in manifestos. They had a certain degree of impact, not always quite as great as imagined, but on, on general elections. But day to day, was, was Mrs. Thatcher interested in the politics of Lord and no, not in the slightest. I mean, she didn't want it to go wrong. She wanted her home secretaries to deal with things. But if one looks at the prime minister's files, if, if one did just did a, took along a tape measure, and, and as it were measured the number of papers, the width of the papers devoted to law and order as against education or health or the economy or all these other things, it's a matter of minor importance to her. She left her home secretaries to get on with it, even on things like the death penalty about which she really did care and had obviously quite radical and radically different views from many of her ministers. Uh, but I think that's I, I think that's one of the most intriguing things about the politics of law and order, is that in the end, although you can't understand penal policy or criminal justice policy outside of the politics of it, as a day to day thing in Westminster, the politics of law and order takes take back seat to to many many other things. Yes, that's that's really fascinating, and I think. Um... The, this this finding, and it is a finding in its own way uh, that you just mentioned, stems precisely from the fact that uh, you all have uh, uh, employed different methodological techniques um, in approaching your subject matter. So one can rely only on uh, official papers or on interviews, but you have been doing both as well as other things. Um, could you could you elaborate a little bit on this? Because I'm sure that at least some of our, our audience will be interested in either um, trying to replicate something, uh, not perhaps of this magnitude, but uh, um, in, in different contexts. And of course, we have students uh, who will be watching this and will be eager to hear more about how you went about uh, exploring this uh, seemingly hot subject i say seemingly precisely because of what you said um, well, well sort of just two very quick reflections on this what one of which is 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 actually a staple of criminological research which is interviewing home secretaries you know lots of people have done it um and 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 many of those former office holders are are, are, are fairly open um, as Paul said previously, um, when talking about his own work, it, one of the things I thought that was very interesting talking um, to, to, to former Home Secretaries was their candor or, or their apparent candor. Um, you know, the, they, were, they, were, they were willing by and large, uh, with some exceptions which I'll come to, um, to talk in a fair amount of detail, really, about what they were trying to achieve. And because of the period we were covering, um, you know, really um, finished in the mid-1990s, you know, in the, in the main, of course, the people we were talking to um, were, were former Conservative Home Secretaries, um, the, the party having been in, 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 in power for 18 years. 
Um, what was interesting there, I think, out of those interviews is, is what I took to be the sort of sincerity with which, you know, whether I agree with the policy choices or not, the sincerity with which the policy choices were made. You know, that the, the were sort of broad programs that, that they were trying to achieve. And one of the things that I think is very clear from the politics of law and order is just, just how long in the post-war period parties of both stripes, the main two political parties, sought to stem the rise in the prison population. The, the Tory and Labour alike, one of, as it were, their kind of performance measures in the criminal justice system was, was keeping a cap on the size of the prison population. That, you know, beyond a certain number, whatever that number be, um, you know, it was, it was, this was considered to be, a, you know, a, a justifiable and reasonable prison population. But once you went beyond it, then that was something had gone wrong. Um, the, the thing I said earlier, which I alluded to was um, the, the only people to refuse us um, were, were, were senior Labour Party members. So we got almost clean sweep of previous Conservative Party Home Secretaries. Um, the only ones we missed were ones whose ill health prevented them talking to us. But the Labour Party was singularly unhelpful. And I think it's quite important to put that on the record here. Um, these are supposed to be official histories. Um, of course, one, one, one can't necessarily expect everyone to talk. But the fact that it was commissioned by a Labour government and then Labour politicians refused to cooperate, I think is worth remarking uh, upon. The second final thing, quick, just very quickly in all this, I think the thing that is less, of, less often done is, is using um, prime ministers and cabinet, the prime ministers' records and, cri and, and cabinet minutes. And you know, just in terms of making that observation about, um, the, as it were, the relative unimportance of the politics of law and order, that that's where that comes shining through um and i think you know those are an interesting resource for 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 academics um and 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 similarly no doubt there are a variety of other personal archives i think which um which it will be well worth um scholars criminologists historians pursuing in the future thank you tim thank you um, so can we uh, spend the last few minutes of this uh, conversation focusing on volume five, which is uh, Tim's book on policing, uh, nearly finished, um, and knowing Tim's productivity, uh, it will be finished very soon. So, uh, so Tim, can you uh, tell us uh, a bit more about uh, that volume? Again, reflecting on the same points, really. Yeah, thank, thank you, Leah. Look, it's... it's, it, it's you know, it's a fairly sizable volume because it's a it's a very capacious subject, again covering covering the same period, um, really beginning in the nineteen fifties, um, beginning in the fifties because um, it felt to me that in so far as British policing is concerned, we're really talking England and Wales here. Um, you know, the the post war period really starts with with a royal commission that was established by R. A. Butler. Um, in the early nine, in, in 1960, um, and which reported in 62, gave rise to the Police Act in 64, which basically set the kind of architecture of much of the architecture of policing that's stayed with us since. So that the lead up to that Royal Commission seemed like an, a sensible and important place to start. And that Royal Commission, I think, um, given we've got limited time let me let me just say two or three things which arise out of that royal commission because they speak to the whole of the rest of the history of policing in that period i think the first is to go back to a previous point which is the importance of scandal so that that royal commission came about by chance but butler who'd famously been education secretary a reformist education secretary um you know um very highly considered came to the home office with this very considerable, considerable reputation, um, with, with a desire to be a reformist Home Secretary, particularly in relation to penal policy. And his, his desire was to establish a Royal Commission on Punishment, essentially. He wrote to the Prime Minister at the time, Harold Macmillan, um, asking for permission to do such a thing. And he was, he, essentially, he was stymied by his officials. 
So that Royal Commission never got never got off the ground. Um, the Royal Commission on the Police, by contrast, which he'd never wanted, um, essentially occurred because of scandal. Um, there'd been a minor policing scandal. In short, Butler mishandled the whole thing in Parliament, got himself into a terrible pickle. And basically the only way he could get himself out was by making a promise for an independent inquiry and hence the Royal Commission. So it, it, it was just a, it was an unintended and serendipitous outcome of, you know, political cack handedness basically, which, which Butler is not remembered for, but, but was really rather important. So scandal is one. The second thing is at, at the time, the Royal Commission is, a, is on one sense, it's a rather dismal document. It's very lengthy. It's really rather poorly constructed in, in some ways. And it's hopelessly optimistic in, in, in the way in which it, it sort of sets itself out. But it reflects the times in some ways. You know, we're still in this, as it were, the, the, this, this enlightenment moment where there is a, a deep, entrenched, rather some, from today's perspective, perhaps somewhat naive faith in the power of sort of science and knowledge and so forth to improve the world. And there's a sense in Butler's home office, um, also pervading the Royal Commission, that, that, that research, improved information, greater efficiency, et cetera, et cetera, will lead to a much better police force and much lower crime. Um, and, and at the time in the 60s, one of the things that, that, that came out of all this for anyone who's old enough who watches this and is keen enough on the history of police and, and on, on the TV, the, the, the signal example was Z cars um, in the policing field called unit beat policing. And it was an experiment basically that put cops into cars, got them off their beats, the idea was that they would be able to patrol much larger areas, they'd be much more efficient, it would bring detectives and uniformed officers and so forth together. Um, and anyway, it was, it was a classic story of modern British policing, a kind of experiment that was never carefully de defined and designed, that had loaded onto it hundreds of expectations, all of which were unwieldy and unrealistic, and which eventually not only collapsed under the weight of those expectations, but then was blamed for half the current ills of contemporary British policing. And so the kind of the Royal Commission captures, I think, a moment at which it's the last gasp of hope in British policing. And what we've what we've seen since, I think, in the sort of 30 or 40s, 30 or 40 years since is a kind of a series of scandals, a scramble to try to maintain the reputation of the police in the face of not only those scandals but rising crime conflict with local communities issues of of race and sexism and so forth um and and a kind of and, but an unwillingness really on the part of the police fundamentally i think to change and to reorganize themselves but also similarly within government absolutely no desire to grasp the net and to engage in um, you know, fundamental, at least fundamental thought about reform. So in a sense, the, the period begins with a rather damp squid of a royal commission um, and then goes through the next 40 years crying out for a proper royal commission, but never gets one. Could I add something very briefly to that? If, if one reads the more general papers about uh, both major parties, um, readings of what was possible in crime prevention and crime reduction. Um, they were profoundly pessimistic. Uh, they, the, the conclusion reached by Butler and everybody else was that the major driving force for um, uh, crime reduction was informal social control, that the apparatus of criminal justice actually touched only a very small fragment of, uh, of behavior and at a very late stage. Um, modernization which Tim has alluded to was as it were a default position what else can we do but not an enormous amount of faith I think was placed in it you know uh, there were more more radios and cars there were more computers in, and, and and efficient typewriters in in in, in police stations but the the overall uh, the overall sense was that really this is a, kind of a battle we have lost and we don't know how to win it I don't know if Tim would disagree but uh, well, 
Well, well, without extending it too far, I'll just say one thing. So I, I, I partly agree with that. This would be a point at which we could have a debate. I think it depends when one's reading those papers. It's true that Butler was slightly sceptical and, and worried about the trends, but this was still a period in the early 1960s when they were only, they were only just beginning to spot the rise in crime. So I, I think the degree to which they felt that they were losing the battle um, was quite limited at that stage. They, they were only just beginning to recognize that they were in a battle, is my feeling. And it was later in the decade, and particularly in the following one, in my sense is, that, that as you say, um, the, the kind of realization that, that the levers that needed to be pulled were always going to be pulled by people in other ministries, as it were, to the extent that any of those things would affect crime rates. Um, became, uh, as it were, the kind of standard accepted position. Well, thank you so much both. Uh, we have run out of time, sadly. I'm sure we could be going on uh, for a long time, partly because it's so obvious, and it will be very obvious to our audience, of course, that uh, a huge amount of hard work has gone into uh, those volumes, um, uh, as a result of which, uh, a large number of illuminating insights have been produced. Um, I should clarify, correct me if I'm wrong, that all volumes uh, stemming from the project are published by Routledge. That's correct, right? Um, so um, I, I thank you so much again. It's been an honor for me, and I'm pretty sure that uh, our audience will find uh, this conversation very helpful and inspiring. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Thank you.